Good morning, beloved. Peace be with you. Today in our first reading, we're beginning from the book of Tobit. Um, we just get a few verses, one or two verses from chapter one, and then the rest takes place in chapter two. So as, as usual, we never get the full story. If you want the full story, we always encourage you to read the, 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 what's missing on your own. So sometime today would be uh, really great to read chapter one on your own. Uh, and then you can always, always review most of chapter two. Chapter one, is, you know, obviously is gonna be setting a good context for the rest of the book. But we, we know, we see in chapter one too, especially that uh, Tobit is from the family of, his, his family's from Naphtali, one of the northern, most northern tribes of Israel. Uh, this is taking place in the time when Israel was exiled, or his tribe at least was exiled. Um, it was one of the northern tribes, so one of the first tribes to be conquered by Assyria when they came down and around from the north, conquered and began to exile uh, many of the people. And so Tobit and his family were one of the ones that got exiled back to Assyria. And he's, they say that he says, even today in our passage, he's living in the city of Nineveh in Assyria. So we know Nineveh because that's where Jonah went to go preach, right, to the Ninevites. So uh, that kind of sets a basic little context framework and time, time for um, Tobit and th his story. And his story is really teaching us um, uh, many things. It's going to really uh, evolve from here and talk a lot about God's healing power. We'll see the, the archangel Raphael come in and all these things. But um, today we're just seeing Tobit and not, not so much um, the rest yet. Uh, we see Tobit, a very righteous man. <clears throat> he says even of himself, he's always striven to walk the path of truth and righteousness. If you read chapter one, you'll see how he actually breaks this open and says all the things he does. Basically how he strives to live all the commands and precepts of the Lord that he's, the Lord has given to Israel. Even though, he, he says, even though he's of the northern tribes and those are separated from the southern tribes in Jerusalem. And so if you know a little bit, the southern tribes, during this separation, this split, they worshiped in Jerusalem, like all the tribes were supposed to, but the northern tribes, they worshiped in different places and primarily also in Samaria. They built their own place uh, and worshiped on that mountain. So they didn't, they didn't want to mix for whatever reason, as they're fighting about, um, as they're basically infighting. But Tobit says, uh, I, by myself, still go down to Jerusalem during the traveling feasts, and I keep the feasts like all of Israel are supposed to keep these feasts. So he will travel from the northernest tribes all the way down to the south, bringing all, and he says, I bring all, and he lists out the different animals he brings for sacrifice with him, and the money, and the, all the herbs, and the grain, and the, the different fruits and things he brings for his sacrifice, and he says, I make, and this is how, how much he strives for righteousness and truth. He says, I make a tithe of my income every year to, the, to the Jerusalem, and I make a second tithe that I give and distribute throughout Jerusalem when I get there. We could assume to the poor or those needy that he sees. He goes, and I even make a third tithe that I give specifically to widows and orphans and to converts to Israel, who are, who, to Judaism, who are living in Israel. But he only gives, he gives the second and third tithe every year except for Sabbath years. He takes a rest. <laughs> but he gives three tithes, you know. And he says this is because these are perpetual ordinances that he was taught. So this is what kind of a man he is. And he, he strives, so we see... Um, well, he'll list out too, basically how he strives to live out all the spiritual and corporal acts of mercy. And today we see two of the main ones, uh, two big ones for acts of mercy, burying the dead, he strives to do, and feeding the hungry. He's ready, he sends out Tobit, go find someone, one of our kinsmen who's, who's hungry, has, needs some food, bring him back, let's share this meal with him. Um, <clears throat> So, and what's important though to notice is that Tobit is doing this when it's not popular, when it's counter-cultural. So Assyria and that culture at their time, they're not burying the dead. In fact, it alludes to um, 
Tobit, the king trying to arrest and kill Tobit for burying the dead. You know? And in some sense, when they were punishing people and they would kill them, they would leave them out and not bury them. And that was a way of saying they are cursed. Even in the afterlife, they're being cursed for, as, as part of their punishment for, for whatever they've done. Well, this was like abhorrent to the Jews to not bury the dead, especially their own kinsmen. So they would seek to bury the dead even at the risk of their own life. And that's what we see Tobit doing, burying the dead out of respect even at the risk of his own life. Today, it's very popular to bury the dead <laughs> because of health reasons, right? You're required to. Um, probably what gets more popular is, is the um, cremation, uh, and many times for money reasons, uh, and, but actually what's getting popular, but as it goes against the church, would be cremations and not just burying them, but spreading them all around wherever you want to be or putting them in little jewelry things and wearing them around and everybody in the family gets a little part of the ashes of the loved one. Um, or what's popular now is cremation and taking the ashes and mixing them in with dirt and soil and then bury them in your yard as an eco-friendly way of burying <laughs> your dead. But those, the church says, is not, that's not right. That's not, not only not reverential fully for the person and their remains, but for the family and friends who want to go and anytime they want to go and continue mourning or continue paying respects. How can you go and continue paying respects if you've scattered the ashes at sea or in a river or thrown them off in the wind? There's nowhere to go to pay respects, to continue mourning and grieving, to continue a closure process. This is which is necessary for just natural, normal human psychology. So the church says those are not good. It says we, we should not be doing those things. The church is very, again, countercultural when it comes to burying the dead and how the best ways we should be burying the dead. Because it's not just about us and me and my mourning and my grieving, but other fan, family, other friends. They, you know, our loved ones have friends we don't even know about probably who may want to go and pay their respects at some unknown time in the future that we have no idea. Who are we to take that away from them? You know? So the church is always countercultural, even, even in charitable works. <laughs> <clears throat> But one more thing, we have our charitable, these um, charitable works of, spiritual works of mercy, corporal works of mercy. We want to read them because we're not always familiar with them. And um, many times we can uh, maybe play favorites, you know, with the ones we like. Uh, a good thing to remember is, which uh, very, gets very confusing in our world today, Christianity today, is that the corporal works of mercy and the spiritual works of mercy are not the gospel. They are not the gospel. And it, but if you look at different Christian denominations, you will see them say this is the gospel. But that's not the gospel. Feeding the hungry, visiting the poor, burying the dead is not the gospel. That's not the good news. Jesus didn't come and say, good news, we can bury the dead now. Good news, feed the hungry. No, he said, good news, the kingdom of heaven is here. God's kingdom is here. God's power is here. God's love is here. Good news. Uh, the gospel, the word gospel implies good news from a victory. So as Christians, we say good news. Christ was victorious over sin and death by rising from the dead. <laughs> good news. When we die, we can be raised from the dead too with his spirit inside of us. Good, that's good news. <laughs> the charitable the, the corporal works of mercy and spiritual works of mercy are charitable works that were always expected of the people of God. Why? Because we are people of charity. Why are we people of charity? Because we are children of a God of charity. That's why we do these things, because that's who we are, part of the family of God. Not because that's the good news. That's, that's not the good news. The gospel goes beyond this. These are just always to be expected. And many times we will just pick and choose, but here's all of them. Many times 
people will reduce the, the church to just the corporal works of mercy. Uh, so here's all the corporal works of mercy. Feed the hungry, give drink to the thirsty, clothe the naked, shelter the homeless, visit the sick, visit the imprisoned, and bury the dead. Anytime you bury your loved one, you are participating in corporal works of mercy. But these are, all of these we're supposed to be doing, not just picking, oh, I like feeding the homeless and it makes me feel good, so I'm gonna go do that one and I'm good. Like, all of these are supposed to be part of our natural, virtuous lifestyle. And don't just only hold to the corporal ones that you can see, but the spiritual works of mercy as well. Perhaps these are a little harder, that's why people don't focus on them or proclaim them as well. First one, admonish the sinner. No, oh, don't judge me. No, I'm not judging, but I'm admonishing you. Admonish the sinner. It's a work of mercy to be expected. Instruct the ignorant. That might be ourself. I might have to go read more about the, the faith because I'm ignorant of the faith. Counsel the doubtful. Bear wrongs patiently. Forgive offenses willingly. Comfort the afflicted. Don't just send them to Father. Comfort the afflicted. Pray for the living and the dead. Pray for the living and the dead. Beautiful spiritual and corporal works of mercy. It's supposed to be natural parts of our lifestyle. And remember, the mercy as a virtue is, means it's a, it has become in our life an automatic response that I just do. It just, I don't even have to think about it. It just, I see a need and I just, that's my first response to feed the hungry, help the homeless, uh, admonish the sinner. <laughs> hey, that's not right. Don't be, that's not good to do. That's not going to help your spirit. So this is the a long homily for a daily mass. So Father, we just thank you so much for this natural, normal lifestyle that you've, you call all your people to live, all believers, to live a lifestyle of, of charitable works, spiritual works of mercy and corporal works of mercy. We pray, we thank you that this has been around since the beginning of time. This is not even part of the good news. This was before the good news. And we just pray today that you'd help, it, help us to put more of the spiritual and corporal works of mercy um, active in our lifestyle so they become flesh and a natural part of our everyday life. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.